Okay, so if it's no problem, I'm going to start. So can you hear me well? Okay, nice. I'm just having a little trouble with the with the audio now, but hopefully I'll be able to fix it later. So when you ask a question, please <coughs> just send a message or something like that. But to start off, uh, I, I have a, I want to thank Ivan for <coughs> for the effort of making this seminar. Welcome everyone to this talk. So I'm going to give an overview on polar actions of the group over manifolds, which are precisely those characterized by the existence of some geometric object, object known as a section. So we will study the properties, the basic properties of sections, and from them, from there, we're going to give an explicit description of them whenever we start from a principal object. And from there, we'll try to derive a criterion for polarity. And in the case of symmetric spaces, we will get a satisfactory enough result for the compact and the non-compact type. So to start off, I just want to set the notation that I want to use throughout the talk. I'll be working mostly with complete manifolds, complete Riemannian manifolds, and their symmetry group are going to be, is going to be denoted by I of M, where M is a Riemannian manifold. So note that since M is complete, the geodesics are defined for all time. So the exponential map is defined in the whole tangent bundle. And this exponential map is going to be denoted by EXP, where we simply take the <coughs> lowercase e in this case in order to distinguish it from the B exponential map. We will also be working with Lie groups, which we will also assume to be connected. And for a connected Lie group G, we will call Gothic G its Lie algebra. And this is something that I'm going to do for every, for every group. So if the group is denoted by some capital letter, then the Lie algebra is denoted by the same letter in Gothic. And also, well, we have the Lie exponential map defined for the Lie group. And as I said before, just to distinguish it from the Riemannian case, this exponential map will be noted with a capital E in the EXP. So this group will be related to the manifold by means of a proper isometric action. So what we're doing essentially is we are representing the elements of G as isometries of our complete manifold in such a way that these isometries that we're putting in uh, belong to a closed subgroup of the group of isometries. Mm, I should also remind you that while elements of the Lie group can be realized as isometries of the manifold, the elements of the Lie algebra can be realized as vector fields defined along the ambient manifold. These are known as the fundamental vector fields induced by the elements of the Lie algebra. By their definition, they are made so that the flow of the field X is the exponential of Tx. So these are killing fields, they are killing vector fields. So let's start off by setting the definition of polar actions. We will say that the action is polar if there exists a connected and a connected, complete and inversive manifold sigma of the manifold at M, such that sigma meets all of the orbits of the action. And at every point of sigma, the intersection between the section and the orbit is perpendicular. So the tangent space of sigma and the tangent space of the orbit must be orthogonal with respect to the ambient metric. So these submanifolds are known as sections. And in the case that they are flat submanifolds, we will say that the action is hyperpolar. Mm, I should emphasize that while we're asking that these manifolds are complete and immersed, they, <clears throat> they may not be uh, closed in the ambient manifold or embedded. So just keep that in mind. And the, the easiest picture that we should have in mind for a polar action is the standard representation of the, the group SO2 over R2. So here, the orbits are precisely the origin as well as uh, circles centered around it. And if we think about it for a little, uh, any straight line that goes to the origin is going to be a section. For example, I have here the, <coughs> the straight line uh, y equals zero as our section sigma. Just to have some more pictures in our heads, uh, I've added here some more examples in Euclidean three space. The first one is the standard representation of the big group SO3 in which case it's more or less the same as what happened in the two-dimensional case as before. Here we have an action of SO2, whose orbits are the points of the C-axis as singular orbits, as well as the circles centered around those, those points, which are going to be parallel to the XY plane, and they are the principal orbits. Here in the bottom left corner, we have simply the action of SO2 times R, which gives rise to cylinders around the C-axis, as well as the axis as a singular orbit. And finally, we have the 
action by translations of R2 over R3, which gives a foliation of R3 by parallel planes. So notice that here the sections are going to be straight lines and a plane. And this is not a coincidence, as we will see later on, the geometry of sections. So now let's dig in at the, <coughs> at the basic properties of polar actions. So let's take a polar action of G over M and let sigma be any of its sections. Uh, one of the first questions that would come to mind is what's the dimension of sigma? So maybe if we have two different sections, they could be of different dimension. So it, it could be the case that the dimension is not determined by the group action. But it turns out that this is not the case. And the proof of, the proof of this fact is simply an application of Sark's theorem. <clears throat> what we do is that we use the fact that sigma meets all orbits to deduce that the restriction of the action to the product space G times sigma is a smooth surjective map. So Sark's theorem tells us that since the map is surjective, there must be a point in this product space such that the differential map is a surjective map. So <clears throat> we would find a pair G, P with this property, and by a simple equivariance argument, we may assume that the element G is the identity element. So all in all, we have a, we can find points, a point in the manifold P, such that the differential of the, <clears throat> the differential of the map F over the pair E, P is precisely the tangent space. But since this is the action, it's easy to decompose this diff image of the differential as the sum of the tangent space to the orbit with the tangent space to the, sec to the section. And remember that this sum must be direct because the subspaces intersect orthogonally. But these, the fact that these subspaces are in direct sum is always true for every point in the manifold. So in order for this equation to be true, the point P must have an orbit of maximum dimension. So what we're saying is that the points that we found by Schwarz's theorem must belong to a principal orbit that is a, an orbit of maximum type or an exceptional orbit, which is an orbit that may not have maximum type, but the dimension is exactly the same as the one of principal orbits. And also, because we have the tangent space decomposed as this direct sum, the dimension of sigma must necessarily be the co-dimension of this orbit of maximum dimension. So we simply summarize this as saying that the dimension of sigma is the minimum co-dimension we can attain from the orbits of the action, which, which I remind is called the cohomogeneity of the action. Now, the second question that could come to mind is if there is a relationship between the geometry of the submanifold sigma and the geometry of the ambient manifold. So we could try to codify this relationship by means of the shape operator or the second fundamental form. And we will see that in reality, the, both of these both of these <coughs> objects vanish. To do it, let's start again with a point that belongs to a principal orbit. So these are called regular points. And because of what we've just seen, the, the tangent space to the orbit must necessarily be the normal the normal space to the section, which I denote here by, by a lowercase new. So in particular, if we take any normal vector to the section, it must be tangent to the orbit. And therefore, we can extend this normal vector to one of those fundamental vector fields induced by the action. But, uh, but as I said before, this field is a killing field. So its covariant derivative must be anti-symmetric. So this gives us that the shape operator relative to this normal vector must be a skew symmetric tensor field. And since, this, since the shape operator is always symmetric, this gives us the only possibility that the shape operator is identically zero. So what this proves is that the second fundamental form always vanishes at points belonging to principal orbits. And now one could prove that these points constitute an open dense subset of the section. And this is a little less immediate. In fact, Ivan and I wrote a small note uh, detailing the proof that appears in the literature. But by taking this, <coughs> this density result and this, this is small computation, we deduce that sigma is always a totally geodesic submanifold of the ambient space. And this is a very rigid condition. It, it leaves us with very little possibilities for the sections. In any case, from these two propositions that we've just seen, we can deduce more, <coughs> more immediate facts. For example, the first one is that 
when we start with a given section, then the only way to obtain more sections for the action must be done by taking elements of the group and making them act on the section. So another way of saying this is that the group G acts transitively on the set of sections for the polar action. And also in particular, uh, for every point in the ambient manifold, there will always be at least one section passing through it. So this is one result. And another one is that if we start from one of these regular points, the fact that sigma is totally geodesic and complete means that it must be the exponential image of a certain vector subspace of the tangent space. This subspace is precisely the tangent space to sigma. And since we are in the irregular case, this is precisely the normal space of the orbit. So we have a description of, of sigma that does not depend on whether we know it is a section or not. So this is our, our candidate for a section for a given action. And we can go in reverse now. So we could start from a principal orbit, from which would take a point in that principal orbit, and the action would be polar if and only if this set is a section. So we, we should only have to focus on this, <clears throat> on this particular subset. And this begs the question, if we start from a point belonging to a, regular, to a regular orbit, when does this happen? Well, for now, I'm going to leave this question on hold because now that we know some more properties, I wanted to, <clears throat> I wanted to see more advanced examples of polar actions. The first one is the, the case in which we have the lowest cohomogeneity possible. These are the cohomogeneity one actions whose principal orbits are hypersurfaces. And we will see that in fact, these actions are always polar. So why is this? Let's again take the any point belonging to a principal orbit and let's try to check if the set that we defined earlier is a section for the action. So, so, so far, we know that the orbit is a hypersurface. So the normal space to this must be a straight line. And the image by the exponential map must be a certain geodesic that is normal to the orbit. And that's our only possible candidate for a section. And that's precisely what we're going to, to see. We simply take the geodesic I just mentioned with a normal initial condition. And we will see that it meets all orbits orthogonally. The meeting all orbits part, I'm going to I'm not going to prove for now, but we'll see it later in a more general case. But the orthogonality is very easy to check. Because if we simply take any vector field belonging to the algebra, we can consider the scalar product that the geodesic makes with the fundamental vector field along such along such curve. And we can try to see if it's constant or not. We can simply take the derivative of this scalar product with respect to t. And by using that gamma is a geodesic, so gamma prime is a parallel field, and the, <clears throat> and the covariant derivative of, the, of this field must be stoichiometric because with cycling field, the derivative of this scalar product is precisely the scalar product between gamma prime and the covariant derivative of x of x star at gamma prime, which must be zero by skew symmetry. And this means that the <clears throat> that this that this scalar product must be constant. And since we started off from a vector that is normal to the orbit, this gives us that they are always orthogonal, the geodesic with respect to the fundamental vector fields. And now finally, remember that the tangent space to any orbit is obtained by taking the fundamental vector fields at such point. And we deduce that every cohomogeneity one action is a polar action. Can I ask now, a question? Yeah, sure. Can it happen? So like, okay, it will intersect every orbit orthogonally. Yeah. Uh, can it happen that it will self-intersect but will not be a closed geodesic? Mm, I think so. Like maybe you could try an example in something of compact type. Like what about an action by rotations on the torus? Where the, where a section would be a circle perpendicular to the yeah yeah but like if it's if it's a closed geodesic like basically yeah. it, its image is a circle then it's fine so it will be an embedded uh, section which mm -hmm. is nice but can it can it happen that it is a self intersecting geodesic which is not closed like you know sometimes on uh you can take like a cone or a cylinder with a weird metric and there you can have like self intersecting geodesic which are not closed it just intersect itself once and then go away. So their image is not a submanifold. Can it happen here? 
I think it shouldn't happen, but to be honest, I'm, I'm not sure. But I, I, mean, I mean, that's a very interesting question because, mm. yeah, I'm, in fact, it's really sweeping under the rug the fact that this is not manifold to start with. Yeah. I mean, well, it's, it's never the case in like symmetric spaces or like yeah. good symmetric spaces of like one type. Um, but yeah, it, I, I mean, in theory, maybe it can happen that the only thing that can fail is that it's a sub, the image is a submanifold if it's like self intersects. Yeah, that's the only problem really. Mm -hmm. Since I'm just thinking of, of where of places where the exponential map is a diffeomorphism that isn't usually a problem, but yeah, I think it's a very an interesting matter to see. Okay, I, I look at that because because it's the, the I I took this from the book by Alexandrino and maybe okay. maybe he, skip, he speaks about the character of being a submanifold. Okay, thanks thanks for reading. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so. So we've just seen that in this case, the cohomogeneity one actions are polar, and now one may wonder if this is still the case in low cohomogeneity actions, like in cohomogeneity two or three. But once we <clears throat> once we get the cohomogeneity up in one unit, it all goes to waste. And this is one of the simplest examples of cohomogeneity two act in a cohomogeneity two action. This is simply an isometric action on the Euclidean three space, which we think of c times the real line and and this is an action of the real line over r3 defined by the following formula and whose orbits are precisely the c axis as well as the spirals that go around it so as we've just seen if the action were polar there should be a section through the origin that should be a totally geodesic submanifold that is normal to the axis and is complete so this forces it to be the xy plane but once we look at the intersection of this xy plane with the rest of the orbits, we see that the intersection is not orthogonal, so the action cannot be polar. So now, this next example is a very classic example, and it concerns representations, and it gives a characterization of the polar representations as certain isotropy representations. So by polar representation, we simply mean a polar action in which every element acts as a linear map, as a linear isometry of the of the space. <clears throat> so now we're going to go towards symmetric spaces and assume that we start with a symmetric space M that we assume is semi-simple and simply connected. So when we take an arbitrary point in the symmetric space, we can write M as the quotient of G modulo K where G is the identity component of the isometry group and K is the isotropy group at the point O. And remember that the isotropy K is always a compact subgroup. This is, a, this is the information that we have at the Lie group level and at the Lie algebra level, since we have <coughs> a geodesic symmetry of the symmetric space, that symmetry will induce a homomorphism of Lie algebras known as the Cartan evolution. And since this is an involution, it will have two eigenvalues, one minus one, and the corresponding eigenspaces, which I've called here K and P, uh, constitute a decomposition of G known as the Cartan decomposition. In this case, in this case, K is precisely the Lie algebra of the isotropy group, and P is the orthogonal complement of K with respect to killing form, which gives us another way to think of the decomposition. And in this case, while K is a subalgebra, and P is not necessarily, not necessarily a subalgebra, we can identify P with the tangent space of M at the origin. And to do this, we simply take the vectors on P and we identify them with their fundamental vector fields evaluated at the origin. So with this isomorphism, one can identify the isotropy representation of the, of the compact group K over the Euclidean space T0 of M with the adjoint representation of K over the vector space P. And any such representation is known as an S representation. Well, it turns out that any such representation is always polar. And the sections of this action are precisely maximal abelian subspaces contained in P. And as, as we saw before, the group acting on the manifold must act transitively on the set of sections. So in particular, we use that maximal abelian subspaces of P are conjugate. So if you know about the correspondences, about the correspondence between these subspaces and maximal flats in the symmetric space, 
this also means that <clears throat> given any given any two maximal plots in a symmetric space passing through the origin, they are always congruent. And also this setup can be can be generalized for the case of semi-simple groups with finite center and everything still holds. So maximal abelian subspaces of the P that appears in the Cartan decomposition are always conjugate. Well, we know that S representations are polar now, and it turns out it turns out that the converse is also true. And it's due to a theorem approved by Dadok, and it comes from a classification result of such representations. And indeed, given any polar representation over a Euclidean space, that will be orbit equivalent to the S representation associated to an adequate symmetric space. So now we come back to, to the question that we left on hold. We knew that if we start from a principal orbit, from a point in the principal orbit, then the set that I've defined here uh, is the only possible candidate cross section. So we need to check that this set sigma is a totally geodesic submanifold, that it intersects all orbits, and that the intersection is orthogonal. So first we're going to we're going to study the part of intersecting all orbits. And it turns out that it's true that sigma intersects all orbits, even if P is not necessarily a point in a principal orbit. And the proof is a very simple variational argument. To do this, we start with P, which is contained in its orbit, and we consider any orbit uh, different from the orbit of P. We want to show that there is a point of intersection between sigma and this new orbit. What we can always do is to take a minimizing geodesic that connects the orbit of P with this orbit in blue. Notice that this is possible because we are complete manifolds and orbits are closed. And also because this is a geodesic, it must be the it must be the exponential map of a certain straight line directed by some tangent vector that is in the ambient manifold. Also, since this is a minimizing geodesic, if we take any variation of the geodesic gamma by curves that start in points of the first orbit and end in points of the second orbit, then by taking the length functional and taking the derivative at time zero, this, this derivative must be equal to zero because of its minimizing property. But we, we can control this derivative because of the first variation formula, which I remind has some integral term and some scalar products at the points of non-dispersiability, which here aren't a problem because we're working with geodesics. So we have these three terms. We can already eliminate the first term because we are working with geodesics. And the second term can also be eliminated as long as we only work with variations in which the endpoint is fixed. So here, so in the <coughs> so the endpoints of the variation must be fixed. In the in the orbit of Q, but we may let them vary in the orbit of P. And notice that the variation field at any of those variations will be a tangent vector to the orbit, and every tangent vector can be obtained by a variation field. So in the end, we get that this <coughs> that this length functional whose derivative is always zero satisfies the following relationship, where V of zero may be any tangent vector to the orbit. So in fact, the vector psi that directs the geodesic must be normal to the orbit. And this means that the, that the curve gamma is contained in the submanifold. So sigma indeed intersects all orbits. So now that's one part covered. And now we need to know if it intersects the orbits orthogonally. To, to see this, we will use a more general setting, which is the one in which we work with totally geodesic submanifolds in general and killing vector fields in general. So let's now think about a complete and totally geodesic submanifold of our MB manifold, which is which we should think as our candidate for a section. And let's take any killing vector field on the manifold, which again we should think as a fundamental vector field induced by <coughs> the V algebra. What we will do is we will we will see the orthogonality condition as a local as a local one by observing how this vector field behaves along the geodesics of gamma. So we'll take a geodes any geodesic of gamma, oh, sorry, any geodesic of sigma, and it's also a geodesic of the ambient manifold. And now we restrict our killing vector field to the geodesic. So since X is a killing field, 
this restriction must be a Jacobi vector field, which means that it must satisf satisfy this second order ODE, in which involves the curvature tensor of the ambient manifold. And since we're working with curvature, I'm simply putting here my sign convention for the tensor just to, for completeness sake. And we're going to study the tangent part and the normal part of this Jacobi equation when applied to our specific field. So first we need to split this field J as a tangent part, as a normal, and a normal part. To do it, let's take an orthonormal frame along gamma, an orthonormal parallel frame of vector fields along gamma, and we will say that it's adapted in the sense that the first vectors E sub i will be tangent to the submanifold, while the next vectors fj will be normal to the submanifolds. And we may also assume that the geodesic gamma is of unit speed and the, <coughs> and the first parallel field is the derivative of gamma. So now we simply write j as a combination of these fields, and we have a tangent part in blue here, which is the, this first summon with the E sub i's, and then we have the normal part, which is the summons involving the FJs. And now we need to know what happens when we take the second derivative of this field and what happens when we apply the Jacobi operator. So taking second derivatives uh, in practice simply is taking the second derivatives of the coordinate functions because we are in parallel fields. But it turns out that if we apply the Jacobi operator to the tangent part and the normal part, those will remain also tangent and normal respectively. This is because if we <coughs> take the curvature operator at one of the EIs, this is the same as taking the curvature of three tangent vectors. And this must be again tangent because the submanifold is totally geodesic. So in the end, these <coughs> so in the end, the Jacobi operator will give us a linear combination of more tangent vectors. On the other hand, if we take a normal vector and we apply it the Jacobi operator, we can try to take the scalar product with a tangent vector. We simply use the symmetries of the curvature tensor and we write it as the product of a normal vector with the curvature of three vectors, which is again tangent. So the scalar product must be zero. Well, simply, we're now simply plugging these results in a Jacobi equation. And we get that the following expression is always true, which is the following expression, which has this tangent part in blue and this normal part in red must be zero. So in particular, the tangent part is zero. So this gives us the, the following system of, system of second order uh, differential equations. So what we've, what we've shown is that these coordinates satisfy a second order of B. So in particular, these coordinates will be determined by their value at zero and the value of the derivatives at zero. So as a consequence, when we try to think of it in terms of our original field, the Jacobi field J will be orthogonal to sigma. That is, there will be no tangent part if and only if the Jacobi field at zero and the derivative of the Jacobi field at zero are normal to sigma. Now remember how we define the Jacobi field as the restriction of X. So in other words, X is normal to sigma along the geodesic if and only if X is normal to sigma at P and the derivative of X sends the derivative of gamma to a normal vector. And now by fixing this point P and taking all of the geodesics emanating through P, this, this will cover all the three geodesics of manifold. And by applying this criterion for every one of such curves, we arrive at the following. We have the following condition, that is that X will be normal to gamma if and only if X is normal to gamma at any chosen at one chosen point and the covariant derivative of X sends the tangent space at that point to the normal space at that point. So this originally uh, global, so that this originally global seeming condition has been turned into a local condition. <clears throat> and by returning to the case of isometric actions, we simply change this field X to all the possible fundamental vector fields and we deduce that if we take any isometric action and a certain totally geodesic submanifold, then the submanifold is, is orthogonal to the orbits if and only if all these fundamental fields satisfy the local condition. And 
So now that is everything that we're going to need for the general case of polar actions on Riemannian manifolds. Remember that we still haven't covered whether or not the set that we proposed as a candidate is a section or not. So for that, we're going to need a little more control on determining when, when a certain set is a totally just exact manifold. But fortunately, in the case of symmetric spaces, we can characterize them. Well, in symmetric spaces, uh, the total geodesics of manifolds are algebraically characterized by the so-called little persistence. To see this, we can take any symmetric space, like we did before, and we write it as the homogeneous space G mod K by fixing some base point O, which is the origin of the manifold. Remember that we had a Cartan decomposition induced from a certain Cartan evolution that came from the geodesic symmetry. And also in symmetric spaces, there are well-known formulas for the covariant derivative, for the curvature tensor, and for the geodesics, as long as we are computing them at the origin. So we have been written here. And if we take a closer look at the definition of the curvature tensor, notice that it's essentially a triple bracket. So if we think of totally geodesic submanifolds that pass through the origin, then the tangent space to any such totally geodesic manifold must be closed under this triple bracket operation. So these vector subspaces of the space P are known as Lichtrupel systems. So in essence, from a totally geodesic submanifold, we get the Lichtrupel systems. And the interesting part is that we can go backwards this procedure. That is, given a Lichtrupel system, we can construct a totally geodesic submanifold tangent to the system. In order to see this, we simply take one of these systems, we call it V, and that is contained in P, and we assume that it satisfies the relationship. So we consider the Lie algebra generated by the subspace V, and by using the bracket relation, we know that V must be precisely the vector space plus the commutator of the vector space with itself. Also, one can check that this V here is the P part of the Lie algebra, of the Lie algebra, while the commutator is the K part of the Lie algebra. Well, by parts, I simply mean the projections. We take then the subalgebra. So there is a connected subgroup associated to this subalgebra, which, is, which I will call simply capital V. Well, the orbit of B through the origin is precisely the total agent six submanifold that we want to that we need. So this is because it's obviously a submanifold. The tangent space is going to be the projection of the Lie algebra over P. So it's the so it's our original Lie system. And to see that it's totally geodesic, notice that by taking any vector that is tangent to B, say X, the geodesic of the ambient manifold starting with initial condition x is precisely given by taking the, the exponential map and multiplying by the origin. But the exponential map here, the Lie exponential map, takes the vector space B to the Lie group capital B. So this geodesic is contained in the orbit. So this proves that the <coughs> submanifold is totally geodesic and it's also complete because these, because these geodesics are defined for all time. To summarize, we get that there is a bijective correspondence between complete totally geodesic submanifolds passing through the origin and literal systems in the vector space P. In fact, we can, we can if we know <coughs> the characterization of flatness for symmetric spaces, we can restrict this correspondence to a new correspondence between the complete and flat totally geodesic submanifolds through the origin and the abelian subspaces of P, which we already mentioned when we talked about S representations. And this, <coughs> this, last, this last part is very good for our purposes because it will allow us as well as a, to distinguish polarity and hyperpolarity because we know when these submanifolds are flat or not. And now finally, we're going to develop a criterion for polarity over symmetric spaces of compact type and non-compact type. So in this case, while the statement for polarity will be the same as we will see later, the method that we'll need to, that we'll need to follow 
in order to prove that statement would be different depending on whether we are in the compact case or the non-compact case. So uh, I will start by pointing out some important differences between the both, between both types. So in this left side, I'm going to be working with symmetric spaces of compact type, while in the right side, I'm going to work with symmetric spaces of the non-compact type. The first step we'll need to do is to find a suitable metric in the Lie algebra of G, <clears throat> a suitable metric, and then this metric will give us a scalar product in the tangent space, and we will normalize the metric on the manifold so that the so that both scalar products are the same. In the compact case, this is very simple to do. We simply take any inner product of G that is invariant under the adjoint representation. We can do that because G is compact. In the non-compact case, we can't do this, but we can simply define a, a scalar product by using the killing form. It will be minus the killing form at x comma theta y. And one can check that this is again an inner product on the Lie algebra. So in the compact case, by definition of the scalar product, all inner derivations are going to be skew symmetric transformations of the Lie algebra. Meanwhile, in the non-compact case, the inner derivations induced by elements of K will be skew symmetric, but the elements induced from vectors in P now will be symmetric transformations. And to finish, we simply extend these scalar products in both cases that are restricted to P now, and we extend it to invariant metrics on M, which is something that we can do because it's easy to, to see that these <coughs> metrics are isotopy invariant. So now we come to the age old question. If we take now a group of isometries of the manifold, so a, connect, so a closed subgroup of the group G, with what we will call H, that is connected and such that the orbit of the origin is a principal orbit, we want to determine when the action of H over the manifold is polar. So the first thing we need to know is that remember that the action will be polar if and only if there is a section through the origin. And this section will be tangent to the whole normal space of the orbit. So we, we first need to determine this normal space. And that's simply the set of all elements of P that are orthogonal to all vectors in H, which can also be written as the orthogonal complement, which is what, what this <coughs> minus sign inside the circle means. So the orthogonal complement of the projection of H on P inside only the subspace P. So we call this subspace HP per, and we know that the action of H is polar if and only if HP per generates a section for the action. So it, it should be a totally geodesic submanifold that meets all orbits. That's something we already know, the meeting all orbits part, but it must be, meet them orthogonally. So the fact that sigma is totally geodesic is already characterized by the vector space HP per being a literal system. And what about the orthogonality? Well, we can simply try to use the local criterion that we developed earlier <coughs> by taking simply the elements of the Lie algebra of H. I remembering that now the tangent space to this, <coughs> to this hypothetical section will be HP per and the normal space will be the projection of H over P. So if you write this criterion, it's the same as saying that given any vector x in H and any two normal vectors, psi and eta, this scalar product must be zero. But remember that we're working at the origin and we know how the covariant derivative behaves in this case. We can replace the covariant derivative here essentially by the Lie derivative, by taking the Lie bracket with respect to the fundamental vector field induced by psi. And since we have here the fundamental uh, bracket of two fundamental fields, it's exactly the same as taking the fundamental field of the bracket and changing the sign. Now, the computation that we have here is done on the tangent space, and we simply pull it back to the Lie algebra, which in, which in practice is simply removing the star. So we have a, now this scalar product inside the Lie algebra, and it must be zero. But note that uh, the, <coughs> the bracket psi comma x can also be seen as 
the operator at Xi acting on X. And this operator is skew symmetric in the compact case and symmetric in the non-compact case. So we can always change the at Xi to the other side as long as in the compact case we change the minus for a plus sign or in a non-compact case we have the minus sign as it is. So by this, uh, using this new formula, we can reinterpret this local condition as all elements of the D algebra H being orthogonal to all possible brackets of elements in H P pair. And this is precisely what appears in a theorem proved by Gorotsky for the compact case and Bert Diaz Ramos and Tamaru for the non-compact case, which is exactly what we've arrived at. The action of H over M is polar if and only if H P pair is a literal system and the bracket of H P pair with itself remains orthogonal to H. And simply remember that totally that flat totally USX sub manifolds corresponded to abelian subspaces. So from here we get a very simple simple criterion for hyperpolarity. The action is hyperpolar if and only if H P pair is a maximal abelian subspaces. So and just as a last remark. Notice that while this may seem like a fully algebraic condition, remember that we need to meet some topological constraints before. Working with Lie algebras is exactly the same as working with connected subgroups, but we need to know a priori that the connected subgroup that we're working with is already closed. And also we need to guarantee that the orbit through the origin is principal. If it weren't, well, there are other criteria for checking polarity in these cases, but what we can also do is to simply change our base point, which simply corresponds to taking a conjugate of H. So, so the problem here would be in reality to determine whether H is closed or not. Uh, well, that was everything that I wanted to talk to you about. So once again, thank you all for coming to the seminar and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Rama. Uh, okay, does anyone have any questions? Um, maybe I can ask one. Yeah, sure. Um, first of all, just how did you animate it so nicely? <laughs> <laughs> um, the morph function of PowerPoint makes wonders. <laughs> Oh, that's that's nice. Yeah, yeah, that was very good. Uh, Thanks. <laughs> like my, my question was at the very end, you said that you need to. So we need to also know. So we have this algebraic condition on this HP perp, yeah. but we also know need to know a priori that the action is polar, uh, which is we need the group corresponding to H to be closed, right? Mm -hmm. The subgroup with the subgroup. Is there any? Do you know anything about like? doing something with like polar actions and stuff where the actions are not proper. Mm, that's something that I haven't encountered as of now, okay. because what I've done for now is to work with, for now I've worked with only, <clears throat> only sub algebra contained in the solvable part when we take the Basawa decomposition. And yeah. then there, there is no problem because everything is closed. Everything is diffeomorphic to the algebra by the exponential map. So yeah, I, you you would catch me with that part. So okay. for now, I know nothing about taking the closeness part. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, can I also maybe ask about the so in your abstract you mentioned that polar actions kind of generalize the polar decomposition for symmetric uh, operators or like uh, symmetric Hermitian operators. How yeah, how, how does it work? Like yeah, so simply. Uh, this is something that, for, for example, appears in a general theory of canonical forms, which is why the, the name canonical form appears. So the spectral theorem for symmetric matrices simply says that given any symmetric matrix, well, then we can change the basis in order to, to convert it into a diagonal matrix. Mm -hmm. So this can be thought of as the group, for example, ON or SON in this case, acting on the set of matrices by change of basis. So the statement is simply that the set of diagonal matrices is a section. For example, 
A, a, a very clear example is the adjoint representation of SLNR mod SON, which is the symmetric, which is the spectral theorem, but in the case of matrices with trace zero. Mm -hmm. so that's what I meant by the generalization okay. of the spectral theorem. And in the Hermitian case, this would be something like SUN acting on symmetric Hermitian matrices. Yeah, I and I think it should work as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I haven't checked it. I haven't really checked it at some point, but yeah. to me it makes sense. And it's something that Pauli and Turing say in the introduction. Yeah. Okay. And, and, it's, and it's a good alternative perspective to thinking about these action by rotations. Like It's like two ways of introducing polar actions, thinking either of these rotations in the plane or uh, canonical forms of matrices.